this afternoon's chair seminar. It's my delightful pleasure to introduce to you Alan Jones, today's speaker. He is the Chief Executive Officer of the London Climate Change Agency. And this will need some explanation, and I'm sure that he will add to it as part of his talk. This is a municipal company owned by the London Development Agency and led uh, by Mayor Livingston of London, uh, who is the chairman of the agency. This is the mayor's direct delivery agency and implements projects in the sectors that impact climate change, especially related to energy, water, waste, and transportation, a large part of what cities deliver. Allen has more than 30 years' experience in the housing, building, services, energy, wa water, waste, transportation, and climate change sectors. Prior to his appointment, he was director of the Woking Borough Council's Energy and Environmental Services Company, where he developed and implemented projects through its public-private joint energy services company, two of the first companies of their type in the U UK. During this time at Woking, and this is the most impressive, Allen reduced carbon dioxide emissions by 77.5% from 1990 levels, starting in 1990, and undertook groundbreaking work on energy. Uh, if only all of our cities in California could take on similar projects with similar success. Prior to the Woking Borough Council, Allen worked for the Greater London Council, Inner London Education Authority, for 18 years on major development and regeneration projects, both as an engineer and senior manager. Allen was appointed a member of the British Empire in 1999 for services to energy and water efficiency. He was instrumental in helping the Woking Council win the Queen's Award for Enterprise, Sustainable Development in 2001, the only local authority ever to receive a Queen's Award for Enterprise. Please welcome Alan Jones for this afternoon's seminar. Thank you. Um, hope to cover all those issues. Um, I'll get on with the presentation and, uh, and, and leave more time for questions afterwards. Uh, first of all, uh, hear that okay? Okay. Um, uh, first of all, just a, a, a background which you've heard already. Uh, the Climate Change Agency. One, two, three. There we go. Right, um, London Climate Change Agency um, is a you know, practical delivery agency implementing uh, climate change pr uh, projects, especially in the energy, water, waste, and transport circuit, uh, uh, serv services. Um, and as you've already heard, it's, uh, it's a muni municipal company. I was appointed by the mayor to set up and uh, run the climate change agency. And the reason for that is that um, uh, in his election manifesto in 2004, his, uh, his second term of office, um, he uh, committed to establish a climate change agency for London. And shortly after his election, uh, he looked around the world for the best practice to actually achieve what he was uh, aiming to achieve in London. Um, and he settled on Woking, 25 miles south of London, uh, for what I had achieved there. And as has already been said, um, I reduced uh, CO2 emissions by 77.5% from 1990 levels, um, reduced energy consumption by nearly 50%. And that just gives you an example that it is, it is technically possible to achieve a 50% reduction in energy consumption. Um, also, 44% uh, reduction in water consumption and also big reductions in uh, toxic pollutant emissions. One of the big areas we need to look at, and when you normally see these pie charts, you normally see emissions um, smeared across at end use, which gives us a misleading picture of where emissions are actually coming from. Here you'll see that power stations are by far the biggest uh, uh, emitter of CO2, nearly twice that of transport, although it's appreciated in California, we might have more transport emissions uh, than we do have in London. Um, but both of those, they are two big issues, but also buildings are another uh, big issue. The reason for the uh, inefficiency of uh, centralized power generation, uh, typically when you generate a kilowatt hour of electricity, you, you, you generate approximately two kilowatt hours of heat with that. Power stations don't want that heat, so that's rejected into the atmosphere. 
Uh, these are the average efficiencies of power generation in the UK. This would be similar to the US. Coal, 36%, and that means 64% of the energy is wasted into the atmosphere. Gas, 46%, assuming that's combined cycle. Uh, nuclear, 38%. The grid losses in the UK, 2% in the transmission network and 7% in the distribution network, i.e. 9%. Uh, in the US, uh, your, your total T&D losses are around 13%, so you have greater losses than we do in London. Suffice it to say uh, that uh, we, you only have, by the time the electricity reaches your home, you only have a third of the primary energy that's been burnt at the power station. To make matters worse, in order to get rid of that heat, we use 50% of our water resources to reject that heat into the atmosphere. So all those big steam clouds you see coming out the cooling towers, that's an awful lot of water going up there. The model that we've adopted um, uh, in uh, London, following on what I did in Woking with uh, large-scale decentralized energy, um, and by 2025, uh, that will have reduced CO2 emissions by 33% will meet something like 35% of London's energy demand. And even if this was all natural gas, there will still be a reduction in natural gas consumption simply because we're not using gas to generate electricity and heat separately. But we're also factoring in large-scale alternative fuels, renewable gases and so on, um, to take the place of uh, natural gas consumption so we can move towards a zero-carbon city. Uh, fuel flexibility, the infrastructure of these networks enables us to switch the fuels at the front end. And using private wire networks, it also gives us local security of supply because we can operate in island generation mode every time the grid goes down. But perhaps the biggest issue um, that I unbundled in uh, uh, Woking, and this applies to um, uh, any city that has a grid, um, is the way that the uh, cost of electricity is made up. You won't see this on your bill, but essentially... Uh, you have electricity, which is uh, known as a wholesale price of electricity. And just to put some numbers to that, um, a, a domestic uh, customer, for example, would pay about 10 pence a kilowatt hour, of which 2 pence would be electricity. Transmission and distribution losses, the regulator has calculated that as a, a 1 billion US dollars worth of electricity is lost every year in the UK, just heating up the wires and the transformer chambers. Transmission use system charge, it's the fee that the National Grid Company charges for transporting the electricity from the power station to a grid supply point. Distribution use of system charge, it's the fee that the local electricity network operator charges for transporting the electricity from the grid supply point to the customer. Uh, we then have a number of government taxes and, uh, and levies, um, and you'll have similar uh, um, charges for that, I'm sure. The item I've got marked up as supply margin, and we have a fully deregulated energy market in the UK, and that's it. The smallest bit on the electricity bill is the only bit that's competitive, because you can't change a generator, you can't change a national grid company, and you can't change your local distribution network operator. This is the primary reason why decentralised energy technologies, whether it's combined heat and power, renewable energy or fuel cells, are uneconomic when they operate on a traditional grid system, because the grid trading system doesn't suit them. Laws of physics dictate that electricity will always flow to the nearest load, so if you had a solar PV on your roof or a domestic combined heat and power system and you're generating surplus power, the only place it's going to go to is your next door neighbour. And yet the trading system adds all these losses and charges to that, which is, makes these systems uneconomic. So the true economic values of these technologies are lost. As an engineer, I thought, well, that's nonsense. How can we get around that? How can I extract these true economic values? And to do that, we put in our own private wire network. So we directly connected customers directly to the decentralized energy system, not just with heat networks, but with private wire electricity networks. And because of the economics and the efficiency of this approach, we were able to supply green energy at a lower price than brown energy. And the price gap or the cost differential as, a, as an energy services company enabled us to finance the technology in the first place. So all this was delivered without any form of taxpayer support. Also part of what we do, and this is about looking at communities, um, standalone buildings, difficult to achieve high levels of self-sufficiency, but if you combine it as part of the community, and every community has these, it has uh, residential homes, uh, leisure, retail, uh, offices, and so on, um, we wake up in the morning, we're consuming peak energy to cook our breakfast, we go off to work, kids go off to school. Your energy profile at home is falling right down 
at about the same time that the buildings that you're going to, energy profile is peaking. And if you overlap those together, you get high levels of cell sufficiency. If you were to look at combined heat and power on a baseload basis, and I, I'd be, um, I, you, you'll probably have these in your swimming pools and leisure centers, you'll, you'll probably be up around about 15, 25% baseload. If you combine this with the community and you integrate this with technologies like peak fire absorption cooling and large scale thermal storage, you're up around about 125, 135%, which means you're above the 100% mark and you can operate at, at an independent mode. This is a typical tri-generation system of the type that's run, running Woking Town Centre. Uh, combined heat and power, uh, here it's shown running off of natural gas, but it could also be running off of biogas or syngas. That's backed up with large-scale thermal storage. Uh, that's able to provide thermal energy for up to 48 hours without any input at all, but we actually use that as a uh, much more intelligent than that. We also have backup boilers, peak load, so we are able to provide uh, peak energy all the time from decentralized energy resources. Heat fired absorption cooling, and I'll come on to a bit more detail at the moment, that's a different way of providing air conditioning and refrigeration. So instead of using electricity, we generate chilled water from hot water using the heat fired absorption cooling process. The advantage of that is that not only does it displace electricity that would otherwise be used by conventional electric uh, air conditioning refrigerations, uh, it's a key point in security of supply because if you're going to get a power cut, it's more likely to be in the summer than the winter. It also um, generates electricity from the heat to cool process. So instead of consuming electricity, it generates electricity. It also uses benign, environmentally friendly refrigerants. Uh, air conditioning systems typically use uh, water and a liquid salt. Zero ozone depletion, zero global warming potential. Again, electric air conditioning systems will use a refrigerant like HFC 134A. One tonne of that is equal to 3,500 tonnes of CO2. So you can achieve huge reductions in CO2 equivalent emissions by moving to a tri-generation system. A private wire network, those customers that are directly connected to the private wire network get the benefit of the more affordable energy prices. They also get the benefit of being able to operate an island generation node. So if there's a power cut in the national grid, this system continues to provide heat, cooling and power to its customers. To give an example of that, Woking Town Centre um, has been a power cut in the national grid uh, in the last two years on four occasions. And each time the town centre has continued in operations, hotels, offices, retail, homes, whilst everywhere around them has been in darkness. It's interconnected with a local distribution network and that's uh, used to facilitate uh, imports and exports between the various island generation sites. By the time I'd left Woking, I developed 80 of these island generation sites and they operate as a family and they achieve uh, virtual independence of the grid. We don't buy any electricity from the grid and we don't sell any electricity to the grid. It all goes to customers. Um, Woking Town Centre, uh, the tri-generation station, uh, just bolted onto the side of a multi-storey car park. Uh, in, and that's uh, mainly um, supplied existing build, but it's also supplies new build as well. An example of that is the Holiday Inn Hotel, which happens to be constructed next door. Uh, Four-star, full, fully air-conditioned executive hotel. Gets all its heat, cooling and power from the tri-generation system. Has no plant rooms. And that's freed up additional floor space for additional bedrooms which gives some hidden uh, further economic benefits to the, uh, to the building owner or, or the occupier. Same thing applies to offices and other buildings. These, these large uh, corporate buildings do have very large plant rooms um, and that can be done away with and freed up that space for other economic use. Woking is also home to 10% of total photovoltaics uh, in the UK. Uh, this is from a town of 100,000 population and it achieved that in three years. And that just shows you by combining technical innovation with business innovation and financial innovation just how you can accelerate the take up uh, of uh, economically viable photovoltaics. Woking is also the home to the first fuel cell CHP system in the UK, again by using this mechanism. Moving on to London, the London plan um, which came into being in 2002. Um, amongst other things, that requires developers to uh, implement 10% uh, renewable energy in its development. If it doesn't do so, it doesn't get planning consent. So after the initial battles, um, uh, most developers have come on board now, and some of them have got religion. They, they look at climate change 
and they've actually gone further than the London plan actually requires. Um, we're now in a process that this year, uh, which is currently out for consultation, where we're due to increase that 10% renewables to 20% renewables. So new developments will now require us to have 20% uh, renewable. We've also uh, beefed up the requirements of decentralised energy and we've also introduced a new feature on, on water, the development of separate potable and non-potable uh, water infrastructure. Yeah, the Mayor's Energy Strategy is the backbone of that. That's the detailed document that sets the, the targets and so on. We provide supplementary planning guidance to developers and to local authorities and to consultants and architects so that they can understand how they can achieve uh, the best fit of these technologies. Also interestingly, uh, the Mayor uh, being unique, uh, probably in the world, uh, as, uh, has a climate change duty. So in other words, he has a legal obligation to tackle climate change that was a bill that he put before Parliament. He voluntarily asked for that duty. And that's quite unique anywhere in the world. Mayor's energy strategy, um, the headlines on this, 60% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2050, 20% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2015, and we're on target to achieve those emission savings. However, more recent scientific evidence suggests that we don't have until 2050 to tackle a uh, decent amount of CO2 emissions and at the rate of two parts per million uh, per annum we've probably only got 10 to 15 years uh, without if we don't do anything uh, where we achieve catastrophic climate change so we're actually uh, beefed up our London plan policies to go even further than this. It is also a huge economic development potential if we achieve the Mayor's energy strategy that will deliver something around 3.35 billion pounds so about six and a half billion US dollars worth of economic development and, uh, and employ between 5,000 and 7,500 people. The full report on that is on the London Development Agency's website. Moving on to transport, uh, the London congestion charging zone uh, was introduced in the uh, first uh, term of office of the Mayor. Uh, originally captured um, the city uh, London and surrounding areas and that cost six pounds a day for travelling to the congestion charging zone. However, you can avoid the charge if you have a low uh, or emission vehicle and typically uh, uh, hybrids uh, will be exempt from that charge. That's seen the huge growth of hybrid vehicles in particular, but also electric vehicles, natural gas vehicles and so on. Uh, this year we've extended that zone to capture Westminster and Kensington and Chelsea and we've increased the charge from six, six pounds a day to eight pounds a day. It's reduced CO2 emissions by 19% within the congestion charging zone. The Mayor is going to bring in what's called the low emission zone in 2008. This is different to the congestion charging zone. Uh, this will cover the whole of London, the whole of the Greater London area, not just central London. There are two aspects to that. One is to do with toxic pollutants. It will capture dirty diesels, so lorries, um, HGVs, uh, buses, coaches, uh, that don't meet the tailpipe criteria uh, will pay £25 a day to enter London. Average emission vehicles will continue to pay the £8 a day but within the whole London area rather than the inner London area. If vehicles comply with the uh, Euro 4 emission standards, they'll be exempt from that charge. So again, using the example of the congestion charging zone and rolling that out across the greater London area, uh, we know from our experience and the high pu uh, public support that the Mayor's had for this and the huge reductions in emissions and reduction in congestion that this is what Londoners want. And that will, re that, that, that will reduce uh, uh, the toxic pollution in London. London is one of the most polluted cities in Europe so it becomes an important point to actually reduce the particulate sulphur and not, not, uh, not nitrous oxide. The CO2 element of that applies separately. Um, so even if you meet the toxic pollutant standards but are, are a high CO2 uh, emitter, you'll be caught by that. Uh, that also applies to cars. Um, so if you have uh, an SUV or a four-wheel drive vehicle and you're producing, I don't know, 375 grams per kilometre, you will have to pay £25 a day to enter London. For those that comply with the medium emissions, that will be £8 a day. And for those that comply with, Euro, uh, with the low emission uh, criteria, tailpipe emissions, will be exempt. And again, we see that as driving up the, uh, uh, the, the provision of hybrid vehicles. Already, in addition to the Toyota Prius and the Honda vehicles, Lexus have introduced two 
hybrid sports utility vehicles to take advantage of these uh, of the proposed London zone, low emission zone. In 2010, uh, the smaller, uh, the heavier uh, LGV vehicles will be caught by that charge. Um, we have significant amounts of renewable energy already in London. Uh, this is CIMI, uh, the Centre of Engineering and Manufacturing Excellence, the largest solar photovoltaic system uh, in, in London. This is just a part of it. We also run uh, hydrogen fuel cell buses in London. Uh, we're one of the partners, in, as it happens, with Oakland. Oakland are, are in the same scheme, and so we, we have cooperated with Oakland and, and other uh, European uh, uh, cities um, uh, on this pro program. And it's, it's been a very successful um, trial. We're now in the process of procuring another 70 vehicles, and we're also now looking to produce uh, hydrogen from renewables rather than natural gas. Looking at the London Climate Change Agency, it gives you a, a fuller picture of, a, of what we're doing and puts some uh, project names to energy, water, waste and transport. Uh, this includes the household sector, some big energy efficiency programs in the, in the residential sector, uh, making it cost effective for the able to pay sector to implement energy efficiency. And for the fuel poverty sector, we provide grants, there are several grants available for the uh, fuel poverty uh, to put in things like cavity wall insulation, loft insulation and so on. Better Buildings Partnership is uh, for the commercial sector. 40% uh, of the building emissions in central London come from the commercial sector, the big office buildings, banks, insurance companies, and so on, retail. And, and we've targeted the top 20 building uh, landlords uh, in that, and uh, we've been quite successful in that. And they're quite keen to replicate the, uh, for example, the energy efficiency revolving fund that we've developed for the uh, GLA group. On waste, we're developing a renewable gases and liquid fuels market using waste instead of dumping it in a hole in the ground or burning it, actually producing fuels that we can actually use to provide, uh, to replace natural gas for cogeneration and trigeneration and liquid fuels for uh, transport, designed to the same specification um, but without the emissions. The, uh, the London Climate Change Agency uh, is a, a centre of uh, climate change and energy engineering excellence. It's one of my specific remits to establish that. Uh, we've introduced the carbon accounting scheme that covers emissions from uh, not just energy but also water waste and transport. And uh, we've carried out some advanced research work on housing so that we knew um, in advance how successful we'd be in that area. We've, uh, we're working with the London boroughs. There are 32 London boroughs in the Corporation of London. Um, and uh, we've had some success there in getting the boroughs to replicate what we're doing at a pan-London level, at a local level. That would be a bit like your state and city government arrangement. Uh, energy Efficiency Revolving Funds, this is a, a financial model that sets in place a capital fund at the outset, um, but the revenue returns go back into the capital fund, so you don't need as much money to invest in uh, projects because you're able to capture the revenue savings that go back into the capital fund. Uh, on planning, we give technical advice not just to uh, the boroughs but also to developers um, and to consultants and architects. And uh, we give a bit more detailed advice to major developments. An example of that is Heathrow Airport where they're going to replace Terminals 1 and 2 with a, a new east terminal. And we've advised them and worked with their consultants as to how they could uh, develop, comply with the London plan uh, on the renewable energy and we've been quite successful in that. And also. Uh, water recovery systems and so on. Uh, the government has now latched on to this and uh, they want to roll out the Woking and London models across other major cities in the UK and that work has just recently started. I've also been involved not only with the London plan but also the government's uh, energy review, stern review etc. in particular on decentralised energy. Uh, in between establishing the London ESCO and, and dealing with major projects, there is a bit of a time gap period. So being aware of the politics here and politicians like to be able to show they're doing something from day one. Uh, we've implemented a series of flagship projects uh, directly ourselves. Uh, London Transport Museum, for example, that has a, a large-scale photovoltaic project. That one's interesting because that's the first time anyone's gained planning consent for a historic listed building, which just shows you what you can achieve. Uh, Palestra, which is our new headquarters, that has an integrated solar energy and, and wind uh, uh, energy system. Uh, City Hall, uh, which we've gained planning, planning consent on and will be shortly starting this month. In progress, we have uh, several um, fuel cell tri-generation uh, projects. 
and the London Development Agency, which is a regional development agency, picking up these uh, decentralized energy systems and new water networks on, on their own development. Uh, the Water Action Plan, uh, which is going to become quite important for London. Uh, London is, um, has had a continuous dry period of 19 months. It now has less rainfall than Istanbul or Dallas, and so water has now become a, a hot topic for us. Park Raw, which, uh, which is a project that uh, will show you what we're doing with waste. Aspalestra, 14 wind turbines, a solar PV system. City Hall, and we're the, uh, that's actually, uh, the architect Norman Foster thinks that's now improved the appearance of, uh, of City Hall. On water, as I said before, 50% of UK water resources is used to evaporate heat from central power station cooling towers, and that, that's about 2.5 million litres of water per hour is ejected into the atmosphere for a 1,000 megawatt power station. Uh, we only drink 2% of water that's treated to drinking water standards. Most of it is, is used for other purposes. Uh, for the residential sector, a third of that is used for flushing toilets. Um, and we've actually, um, you know, water is one of the largest CO2 emitters in a city like London. And uh, London's water consumption is responsible for about 351,000 tonnes of CO2 emissions. So reducing water consumption also reduces CO2 emissions. The mayor is uh, opposed to desalination. Uh, he doesn't see the logic of tackling climate change by producing more emissions through energy guzzling desalination plants. And so we're adopting the, the European method of communal scale, rainwater harvesting, greywater recycling, boreholes, dewatering of waste, and creating our own water infrastructure. Water authorities typically capture about 10 to 20% of water resources. Most of it's lost. They just dig a hole in the ground, a reservoir, and hope that it rains. Uh, we have to have much more certainty where our water comes from. That's led us to develop new water resources, um, including um, the production of water from uh, high, the combination of hydrogen and oxygen. Park Raw, um, this is a project, instead of burning waste, uh, you, 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 if you, you, at the moment, most cities either put waste in landfill or they burn it in an incinerator. Incineration is a very inefficient technology. Uh, typically, they raise steam and then generate electricity for a steam turbine, which is about 15% efficient. By converting these uh, wastes into using new technologies like anaerobic digestion, gasification, and pyrolysis, you can increase the efficiency to about 80-85%. Uh, this is part raw. 70% um, of that is uh, organic material, mainly restaurant waste. That's converted into a biogas to supply combined heat and power and tri generation. And the non-recyclable fraction of non-organic waste, in particular plastics, is pyrolysized to create a synthetic diesel. The synthetic diesel is very low emission, uh, but it's been designed to the same specification as a conventional diesel so that people do not have to alter their engine timing or anything like that. You can just fit, fill up the bus or the car directly without even knowing that you've got a low emission fuel. Uh, the green, this is generated a green market in London. On the one hand, we have the mayor's planning policies, his regulatory policies. On the other hand, we have a delivery agency actually implementing these projects, show by doing, to draw others in. And uh, we, we are now um, working with companies from Japan, America, Australia, uh, all over the place. And they want to take advantage of London's green economy. And we're being quite clear to them, saying, if you want to take advantage of the green economy, we want your manufacturing and assembly plants in London and not somewhere else, and, uh, and, and that's what we call our Inward Investment Project. An example of one of those, street lighting columns that generate renewable energy. Uh, it's a typical 35 watt SOTS uh, street lighting column, has 400 watts of renewable generation, 300 watts of uh, solar PV, 100 watts from a vertical wind turbine. So they generate about 10 times, or more than 10 times the electricity that the lighting column actually uses. So Individually, not much electricity, but if you think about the thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of lighting columns that somewhere like London has, uh, that could displace several power stations. Um, following on the model from Woking, where I established Thamesway Limited and uh, Thamesway Energy Limited with a Danish partner, uh, we've now uh, procured a private sector partner for our public-private joint venture energy services company called London Esco. We had nine major energy and utility companies bid for that work, including two international oil companies and a large American company. EDF Energy won that uh, uh, tender, and with that company has now been established. It's been established to design, finance, build, and operate decentralized energy systems 
capturing all these renewable energy resources as well as natural gas systems. Uh, this makes it easier for developers to comply with the London plan, so they haven't got to put their own hand in their pocket to finance these systems. Developers typically want to get on and build their development, sell the last, last building, move on to another site, um, whereas ESCOs are around for the long haul. And so and it's an issue about whose core business is it. So it's important for us to establish a pan-London ESCO. The 50 pipeline projects that we have, short, medium, long term, are about two to two and a half billion pounds double that for US dollars, and that gives you a, a feel for how doable it is to actually achieve those mayor's, mayor's economic development targets. The structure of the London ESCO, uh, the London Development Agency, which is, one of the, mayor, which is the Mayor's uh, Regional Development Agency, um, owns the London Climate Change Agency, which I'm Chief Executive of. Uh, the Mayor's Chairman of that company, the Deputy Mayor's Deputy Chairman, and we own 19% of, uh, of the London ESCO, and EDF Energy own 81%. The reason for the percentages is that in the UK we have various uh, company rules, which means that uh, if a company has 20% or more public sector ownership, it's treated as a publicly owned company, and we figured the private sector would not be interested in that, so we keep our shareholding at 19%. However, although the private sector is the majority shareholder, we are the procuring agency, and it's our specification they have to comply with. So they can't go off and build nuclear power stations or oil-fired plants or anything that, uh, uh, that the mayor doesn't want them to do. And so it's structured around the full uh, decentralized energy, um, energy water waste transport that I covered earlier. Our initial tranche of projects that are being undertaken this year, um, we're virtually doubling the capacity of CHP in London, uh, further renewables, uh, large-scale wind farms and so on, fuel cells. As a group, they'll reduce CO2 emissions by 310,000 tonnes per annum and, and bring 100 million pounds of investment into London. Biota is an example of one of the projects uh, as part of the Silvertown Keys development. Um, this is a huge aquarium um, that is divided up into four biomes, similar to the Eden project, but much bigger. Um, and as you move through um, the, the, the various biomes, there's one on the Pacific, uh, Indian Ocean, Atlantic, and, uh, and the British Isles, not only will you have indigenous uh, fish species, but also invertebrates, mammals, um, reptiles, and amphibians. And it's uh, going to be managed by London Zoo. And it's one of, probably one of the best tri-generation schemes you could probably have is to have this type of uh, building. One of our projects that we have to deliver in London is the Olympics. Uh, more importantly, the legacy from the Olympics, the Lower Lee Valley. I'll finish now moving towards um, hydrogen, because one of the things when I was appointed by the mayor, uh, he said, I haven't dealt with all this, he said, oh, by the way, Alan, um, I, I really want to have a hydrogen economy in London. I want to be the first to have a hydrogen economy in London, so that's, you've also got to do that as well. Um, so it's important to know where you've got to get to so that you can set out your infrastructure in such a way. And the reason why um, um, technologies uh, like waste, for example, uh, biogases and syngases uh, are, are incredibly important to us because they're rich in hydrogen. They can be used as gas and liquid fuels today and hydrogen tomorrow. And I actually need some hydrogen fairly soon with, that, with the arrival of the 70 vehicles. Um, this is a, a fuel cell CHP. Um, there's about 350 of these operating worldwide. Uh, this is the one in Woking. Um, you can stand next to these. No noise, no vibration, no, no emissions, no flu. Um, it doesn't look terribly sexy, you know, terri terribly exciting to look at, but it's an, that box is enough energy to fly 200 tonnes. Moving on to the renewable hydrogen economy, uh, we do believe you need to combine hydrogen with renewable energy. Uh, we need to be able to store energy. That's one of the problems with electricity. So when you're, when you're developing a replacement energy carrier, and, and hydrogen, like, uh, like electricity, is an energy carrier, not energy in itself, it is important to combine those two so that intermittency of renewables can be overcome by storage uh, uh, into hydrogen, which also gives us the ability to supply transport as well. However, we think that the actual hydrogen itself will not necessarily be pipelined as such, they'll actually be pipelined as it contained within these renewable gases and liquid fuels. There's no need to convert it to hydrogen until you get to the point of source, whether that's stationary power or CHP or fuel cells and transport. So hydrogen will be the energy carrier of the future, deriving its energy from renewable resources. The barriers to this are not technical, but regulatory and vested interest. Thank you.
take these questions from both the audience and, and the web. Please use the microphone so our web viewers can hear the question. Well, I can't resist. Plan. Okay. The uh, very impressive things which Mayor Livingston has done in London uh, have met some political resistance uh, from having lived there myself when I was, was first there. And do you sense that the mood of the people has changed in the last four years or so to buy into environmental and climate mm -hmm. change issues uh, during that period of time? And if so, what has happened in London? Is that happening worldwide? <laughs> Well, it's interesting because um, the, the, the uh, uh, London um, uh, legislation that, that uh, created the first directly elected mayor was a model that was borrowed from the US. So we believe that the mayor doesn't have any more power than any American mayor may have. Indeed, some, some mayors may have more power. Uh, he actually won the 2000 election on that congestion charge. So despite all the very loud noises and vested interests, when it came down to it, he won the election on a landslide. I mean, there were obviously other things in his manifesto as well, but it was quite clear that the public, the electors, wanted something done about tran transport congestion in London. Uh, transport was moving at a slower pace than horse-drawn carriages in the 19th century, and we weren't many years off from gridlock, and so it was quite an important issue for, for Londoners. The money that's been uh, gained from the congestion charge has been reinvested into public transport, uh, new cycleways, um, and, uh, and this has also led to an increase in people walking. It's, uh, it's amazing people were using their car to drive less than half a mile. Now people walk. And it's also encouraged the take-up of alternative fuel cars. There's been a big growth in uh, hybrid uh, vehicles, for example. And, um, and, and he's making it quite clear, an election issue for 2008, that if you don't like his low emission zone charging, well, don't vote for him. So the mayor is quite clearly sticking his head above the parapet and sticking... Uh, his political reputation on the line. Uh, he's not doing this um, without knowledge of where the public are going. They regularly carry out uh, opinion polls in London so they know just exactly where, where people are, are interested. And climate uh, change in the last couple of years has climbed right up the agenda. It's now an election issue. We do believe that climate change is going to become the politics of the 21st century. And I think that's going to apply to other cities around the world, not just the UK. I'm uh, Tar Benning from California Energy Commission. I was a little late uh, coming for this seminar. Maybe you touched upon that subject. Um, how about the uh, role of nuclear energy in dealing with some of this uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, other conventional uh, environmental uh, problems or issues? Was, sorry, quite, was that a question on nuclear? The role of the nuclear energy in uh, dealing with the greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. and the conventional uh, environmental pollution issues. Given that uh, worldwide there is a big surge in uh, uh, interest in nuclear power yeah. plants. Okay, yeah, I understand the question. Uh, the mayor is opposed to nuclear energy. Um, quite apart from the nuclear issues, the work we have done is that it's not really a carbon free fuel. Um, you, once you take into account the life cycle, and here we're talking about new nuclear build, uh, significant fossil fuels are consumed and CO2 emissions are uh, generated from the extraction and mining and transportation of nuclear fuel. Primarily this comes from places like Australia or Kazakhstan. It's not an indigenous fuel for the UK or for Europe, so there are significant emissions uh, that are, are generated before you even start building a nuclear power station. Nuclear power stations themselves have fossil fuel backup for their safety systems. Uh, for example, British Energy have on their website a figure of 102 grams per kilowatt hour for the operation of a nuclear power station. It's also not readily understood by the public that it can take up to 100 years to decommission a nuclear power station, during which time it's consuming fossil fuels once you start to decommission it. You've also got the long-term transportation and storage impacts of, of nuclear fuel. So, and then, of course, you've got the nuclear issue itself and uh, you know, the, the potential for terrorism, accidents. We've had some of those, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and so on. 
And at the moment, I mean, nuclear waste is actually transported by train through the middle of London, you know, and it's well publicised that that is the case because you see these trains going through. And in today's heightened terrorist list, it just seems absolutely crackers that we're just going to have more of this stuff for terrorists to have a go at. Um, I don't know if Heathrow or any of the other airports are within the uh, city limits of London. Do you have any plans to deal with CO2 emissions associated with aircraft? Um, we, we don't have control directly, but um, the, the mayor has made it quite clear that he's opposed to the, uh, the, the acceleration of, of the uh, aviation industry. The, avi the aviation industry and defense say, well, we only represent a few percent of total global emissions. That tends to exclude the emissions created at the airports themselves, which are huge energy guzzling uh, buildings, as well, and also the transportation to and from airports. But one of the things I think that the British Airports Authority learned from having to comply with the London plan, um, not only was it possible to put renewable energy in their buildings and more efficient technologies like tri-generation, it also encouraged them to increase their energy efficiency. Because when you're looking at 20% renewables, um, if you, um, just give an example, if you've got 100 watt megawatts of energy, and if you were to reduce your energy consumption to 50 megawatts, i.e. 50% reduction, then you're now looking at 20% of 50 megawatts, and not 20% of 100 megawatts. So that was a very quick lesson that they learned. And so we've got high frequency lighting, variable speed drives, even on the, you know, the passenger walkways, the escalators, you name it, they've, got ev they've factored every known energy efficiency device in there, as well as water efficiency, because we also count the carbon savings from water efficiency as well. Um, and the other uh, piece of work that came out of that, we talked to them about their waste, and, um, and uh, for the East Terminal, which is replacing Terminals 1 and 2, it wasn't something they could readily do for that. But as part of the planning process, they've now committed to uh, looking at the capturing of the waste that comes out of Heathrow Airport. And, uh, you know, Heathrow Airport is one of the largest airports in the world, so we're talking megatons of, of, of waste here. Uh, and we, that led us to move the tri-generation from the centre of the airport to the perimeter road, because that's where the waste was being collected from all these different locations and terminals to be captured with a large-scale uh, renewable energy and converting those wastes instead of going off the landfill or incineration, but capturing the waste at Heathrow Airport and converting those into renewable gases that can actually supply the tri-generation system. So that just gives you one example of how it's important to join up energy, water, waste and transport. Uh, they're also interested in using the liquid fuels for running the transportation that actually goes to and from Heathrow Airport significant reductions in CO2 emissions, way beyond what's actually required in the London plan. And that just shows you that airports can make a huge difference to reducing carbon emissions in the aviation industry. I think the aviation industry itself, and certainly Richard Branson, uh, has committed uh, his uh, company to uh, use or move towards using sort of biotype fuels, uh, low emission fuels. Um, I, also, so simple things like uh, changing the way that airplanes take off and land can save 10% of their energy. And I think it's important to press the aviation industry because at the moment they think they're immune, they can carry on without making any changes in efficiency um, on the back of economic development. And I think hopefully what my presentation showed today, you can still have your economic development, you can increase your economic development, but you can clean up the atmosphere at the same time as well. There's still a lot more to be done on aviation because it's a growing problem, um, but uh, you know, it, this isn't necessarily about stopping people from doing what they want to do. It's about doing it without affecting the environment. I'm um, wondering if there's any formal coordination between the City of London and national agencies with regard to both carbon accounting and delegation of responsibilities. Um, we we um, have a link through to, for example, the Department of Trade and Industry. Um, they actually fund the London Development Agency. Um, the Department of Trade and Industry, and DEFRA, and, and, other, including, and other government departments, including Treasury, uh, began to take a joined-up approach to tackling climate change. And, uh, and indeed, and that's the reason why um, the British consulates in the US, and one of the reasons why I'm here, actually, said not only was there a demand from... Uh, 
uh, you know, local states like yourself to find out about what we're doing in London, but we're, we're delighted to come along and do it because we see it as part of how you tackle global climate change. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention during my presentation was the C20, which is the carbon equivalent of the G20. Uh, we launched that in London last year. Uh, this is designed to capture the world's largest cities. 75% uh, of world CO2 emissions come from world cities, and most of them are the large cities. So the only reason it was C20 is it chimed with the G20, which is the extended G8. Um, however, that's now increased to 40, so we now, it's now become the C40. Uh, we signed uh, agreements with the Clinton Foundation last year. They were trying to do something similar within the US, and they've got several hundred towns and cities underneath them. Um, however, we didn't want the world cities, the large world cities, swamped by lots of small cities. So um, we've come to a, a kind of grandfathering arrangement. So it was possible that uh, uh, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, being you know, large cities, could act as the grandfather for smaller towns and cities with, within the U.S. And uh, I, I certainly think that you know, the U.S. are taking the lead there for the Clinton Foundation. And we'd like to see that model rolled out into other countries. So, for example, Paris can roll that out to Marseille, Toulon, or whatever, and Moscow to its uh, cities and so on. So we've captured most of these world cities, and uh, I think, although individually we can't tackle the problem on our own, um, collectively we can, and we can do so without necessarily relying on national governments. So you don't necessarily need your federal government to sign up to this, because you're in California, you're already doing it. You're in the lead in the US, and you're doing so on your own, without any support from the federal government. What kind of metrics are you using to um, demonstrate the program's progress to the populace, to bring it home to them how their activities and, and lifestyle uh, choices impact the city's progress? Well, the, the, I only showed you some of the targets of the Mayor's Energy Strategy, but obviously carbon is, a, is, is the primary one, and uh, uh, it's important for us to report the emissions uh, that uh, we've been able to tackle, reduce. Uh, we have other targets on renewable energy and so on. Transport is quite an important issue for, for the public in London. Uh, we've seen a huge um, uh, increase in the take-up of public transport, both on the London Underground, London buses, but also on surface uh, rail transport. We've seen for the first time the introduction of new tram systems that had been taken out back in the 1960s. We now have trams running again in London. And this has all come about from the income generated from the polluters is going back in, hypothecated, to increase uh, public transport, to in increase mechanisms for uh, walking and for cycling. New cycle lanes have been created in London. You can't do that sort of thing without people re recognising that something's going on. So the mayor is judged by the projects that, they, that the public see are going on in and around London. Were some of your achievements uh, by more fuel switching strategy going from coal to natural gas and it, or, or other cleaner fuel? And if so, how much was just by fuel switching? Um, the, we don't have any coal or oil in London. Um, those power stations were pretty much shut down some time ago. Um, the, uh, the carbon mix of the electricity coming from the grid does come from coal and oil and so on. And when we put decentralized energy systems in, we put natural gas systems in. So uh, you're quite right. Not only are we uh, increasing the efficiency from 33% to, I don't know, 85, 90%, uh, we're also reducing the carbon content of the, of the primary fuel. So together, they actually add up to a significant reduction in CO2 emissions. For every kilowatt hour we generate locally in London, we are displacing kilowatt hours in centralized power generation, which is far more polluting than natural gas fired CHP systems. But we're, also, we're not stopping there. Uh, we're introducing renewable fuels, renewable gases to replace natural gas. And uh, we are, you know, we're working currently at the moment on the zero carbon developments uh, uh, in London. Um, and that will be supplied from 100% renewable. So for the mayor's projects themselves, you know, the London Development Agency, the GLA Group, their project uh, is show by doing we're going well beyond the London plan requirements of 100%. We're, we're looking to develop these sites at 100% renewable. I have uh, a question from one of our web viewers, Natasha Mescal of Ecotech. How do you build point sources emissions inventory, top down or bottom up or a combination? And if it's bottom up for a portion, what emissions reporting inventory system do you use and is there a demo available? 
Uh, sounds quite a complicated Bookkeeping. question. <laughs> yeah, we'd rather just get on and save emissions. Um, we have a, a special team uh, in the GLA group that monitors emissions, not just CO2, but you know, PM, PEMs, NOx, and SOx. And so when we talk about reduction in CO2 emissions, this is, uh, uh, is going against where uh, we have increased emissions because uh, you know, there's more buildings being built in London. London's population is increasing. It's going to be increasing quite significantly over the next 10 to 15 years. So we're, we're having to kind of balance out increased emissions against reduced emissions. And the reduced emissions need to be more significant in order to cover the increased emissions. Um, and so we have a, a range of different tools that capture, for example, new development. So we know what the emissions of new development are going to be because of the London plan, because they can't get planning consent unless they submit this carbon uh, accounting tool uh, that shows what the emissions would be with the base building regulations or what you call here over the building code, and then how they've reduced emissions to comply with the London plan requirements. And that's all uh, based on a, on, a, on a detailed software tool that's used by consulting engineers uh, in, in London. On existing development, um, we have a, a grab of the fuels that are being used in London. So we know what the, the government produces, the carbon content of the grid fuel mix, for example, uh, and the, the local gas and oil and gasoline and diesel uh, products, uh, we know what they are in London. And so we work out the emission factors from that. And so uh, we know where, where we are each year as to what happens if the emissions are going up or down. And so when we talk about uh, carbon and reducing CO2 by 20% by 2015, it's actually against real measures rather than academic measures. Let me interject a, another message from one of our web viewers. This is from Chris Marnay at the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Decentralized fossil generation with combined heat power is discouraged in California because NOx and hydrocarbon emission standards for small stationary engines like micro turbines, I think he's referring to, is much tougher than regulation of mobile sources. Uh, stationary source standards will even get more restrictive this year, and fossil fired generation may be eliminated entirely in distributed generation. How do the emission standards for mobile and stationary sources compare in the UK, and does the same problem exist? Uh, the same problem doesn't exist for CHP simply because we specify low NOx um, CHP systems um, and they, they have catalytic converters for example as well. So um, we take the best um, engineered design technology um, that's manufactured in countries like Denmark, Austria, Germany, the Netherlands. Uh, the UK does manufacture CHP systems but they don't come up to the standard that we're looking for. So we don't allow any old CHP system into, into our um, uh, decentralized energy system. They also have to comply with the NOx and the uh, standards as well. Um, it, I think the point being made about comparing um, micro turbines um, uh, is well made. Um, if you're going to have policies on these smaller scale technologies, which actually would reduce emissions for you, uh, it seems a bit unfair that they're being treated in a different way than, say, the internal combustion engine in a car. So that's something I think we need to look at. I, I think this is why we get back to, you need to look at this problem uh, holistically, energy, water, waste, transport. And yet, we love the organizations love to departmentalize. So the transport department will have a completely different set of emission rules, and the energy department will have another set of uh, emission rules. And it's about getting together and coming up with uh, some sensible policies that drive forward reduction in emissions. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, uh, your presentation, Mr. Jones. I'm interested in your opinion. Um, here in, in California, a carbon tax is not going to be a feasible option. And given that transportation is one of the big contributors to the overall, overall inventory, I'm interested in your opinion in terms of how detrimental you think uh, this is going to be to getting some real quick uh, emission reductions. Yeah. I, uh those same questions were asked before the 2000 election, before the congestion charge. An assumption is made by politicians and by people that the public will be opposed to this. In fact, what we've shown in London, the reverse is true. It actually gets mayors elected. And I think you need to, to be brave enough. And you need to also consider what else could you do that could accelerate the reduction in emissions, not just in CO2 emissions, but toxic pollutant emissions. What can accelerate hybrid vehicles low emission vehicles, even zero emission vehicles uh, from renewable fuels. 
I don't know of any anything else that's going on around the world that can achieve that at any sort of scale other than in London. And the whole point about the world cities working together is if you're going to learn from best practice, you do have to pick up those that really are best practice. So, and not sit there and say, oh, that won't work for California. Why not? It can do. You can dance around your handbags with admission standards and stuff like that. Uh, but if you really want to drive forward quickly, which we have to, we, we don't think we've got more than 10 to 15 years to, uh, to avert catastrophic climate change. Um, and if you do this with the right phasing, this wasn't introduced overnight. It was, you know, this is, this is the congestion charge. It's going to come in in a couple of years' time. It gives people time to change their vehicles. It gives people time to recognize the fact that they could avoid the charge altogether if they went to a low emission vehicle. So really, what's wrong with that? You know, you know, it is, um, you know, there is an example already in the world, in London. So if you want to tackle transport emissions, look at the examples that exist. Another question from one of our viewers, uh, from uh, Chris Scrutton at the Energy Commission. What are you doing with regard to building end use efficiency? Um, that's, well, I've probably skated over that, perhaps rather unfairly, but uh, um, at the beginning of the presentation, you would have heard me say that I've reduced energy consumption by 50%. Uh, these, these are technologies that have been around for a year. They, they run from basic cavity wall loft installation right up to high frequency lighting, daylight linking, building energy management systems, variable speed drives for pumps, fans, and, and even lifts and, uh, and, and uh, uh, automatic uh, walkways and so on. Um, we've done a hell of a lot of that. And the example I just quoted for Heathrow Airport, the encouragement there of the London planning policy is to actually reduce your energy consumption as far as you can first before you apply the renewables rule because it's still 20%, but it's of a lower quantum. And so it's more cost effective for the developer or the building owner to spend his money on uh, energy efficiency measures first so that he brings down. And we want to do that because both will reduce carbon reductions. And so the renewable energy policy is actually an energy efficiency policy because it encourages people to tackle energy efficiency first before they apply the renewable energy policy. Thank you very much. Again, please uh, help me thank our speaker for uh, all the information which he's provided today.